All right. Good evening, everybody. Podcast Forbidden Door 4 is here. And uh, I am joined along with a very special guest, someone that I probably never in a million years would ever think we would cross paths. But we have, and uh, today we have a movie star, stroke survivor, a uh, heart surgery survivor, a uh, girlfriend to an infant, you know, pro wrestler that everybody's talking about. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, D- movie director. And um, Misha Montana's in the house. What's going on? How are you? I'm pretty good. I tell you, you know, if you would have told me six weeks ago that we would be crossing paths, having conversations, and end up doing this, I would have said, you're nuts. Um, But we had uh, some very interesting things go down in the last six weeks, and uh, it led us here. And in the process, for anybody that has followed me for a long time, they'll get a kick out of this. Because just in trying to learn a little bit about you, you know, just your background and finding out that there's a wrestling element of it, I learn that you are a part of XPW. And that blows me away because we're in the year 2023 and Misha Montana is a part of XPW. And for everyone out there, if you look on your screen, Misha, if you look on the right side of your screen, this is XPW 21 years ago in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And if you look to the far right at the commentator's table, you will see yours truly. Oh, my so just to, just to show, this is how we cross paths. But there's a big difference here. All right, if you look close. Comes off the ropes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Overhead slap. Under the I put my, yeah, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable at the extremeness of what's going on. Yeah, that's me at the commentator's table. Yep. So that's me. 21 years ago. 21 years later. This is Misha Montana. A little more interactive. Hey. What happened? I was just in a fucking death match. This is all my real blood. No. Yeah. Really? There's no you, crop blood. So, at so all. did you get hit with I something? Got hit in the head. With? with a chair and a white tube. Yeah, I, I saw. I, oh my god. The light tube looked vicious. Uh, are we? Uh, how are you feeling? I feel great. Let me see the I blood. love it. Look at my knees are all cut up. I got glass. I got. It's looking so cool. So much. So much. Crazy man. I breathe in <laughs> the dust and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And you're you're I, that's amazing, man. How how thank you. How's that experience for you? You know, I actually was really looking forward to doing it and it was something that I was just like all bent on wanting to do it and everybody thought just absolutely not. like you can't remember that it be you probably should be doing something, especially bleeding from the head, probably shouldn't be high on your priority list. But I loved it. I I really enjoyed the rush. I was so nervous. Like, I was trying to hide how nervous I was. Like, I knew that I would love it, but I was extremely nervous. Um, it ended up being everything and then some. Like, I was so high on that experience i actually kept all my blood on my face and i wouldn't let anybody like touch me or like wipe it off or um try to do anything with it because we went to um like ihop afterwards and i had it still on my face and there were fans there like taking pictures but then like everyone else that's trying to enjoy their ihop at like (laughs) one o'clock and let me tell you pomona ihop at 1 a.m. is popping. Right. So there are a lot of people there. They're just like, what is going on? But it was so much fun. I absolutely loved it. Um, I would love to do it again. Every, you know, everybody kind of thought that was a one and done kind of thing. But I am so passionate about, about XPW, about this, you know, art and sport that I really just enjoy it. And I always want to just take it kind of to the next level. It's, it's kind of the... 
the program that I operate on is trying to like be, you know, an actor that entertains people in, in a shock value kind of way. So I really enjoy that kind of stuff. It, I always have enjoyed it. So it's fun for me. It was a great, great experience. You know, I was checking out some of the, the other clips and you had um, some interaction with Jasmine St. Clair and Veronica Kane. And uh, this <laughs> is, yeah, this is one of the pictures. And I got to share, share with you, and just in case Veronica Kane sees this, she'll get a kick out of it as well. 22 years ago, when XPW is coming to Philly, you know, I didn't know much about Rob Black. I didn't know much about Veronica Kane or anything else. But, um, you know, the person that, you know, that asked me if I wanted to do some work behind the scenes says, you know, get to know them a little bit. And he gives me a box of DVDs. And I open up the box, and it's all Veronica Kane movies. And I'm just looking at them like, see, I this is pork rub. That's the closest I get. You know, I'm I'm all you know. I just that's where I, you know I was brought up. You know, my parents were too strict. But here's the thing: when I started working behind the scenes for XPW in 2002, you know, I'm seeing these movies with her. But then there was a couple of nights that everybody goes in my hotel room because they don't want their own hotel room trashed. And me, because I wasn't a wrestler or performer, I got my own room. I felt a little out of place. They all come in, hang out. And here's Veronica Kane on my bed in sweatpants, one of the coolest girls, women that I ever met in the world of pro wrestling. And like, I'm just amazed, like how, like you, you look at the performer and then you look at the person and two totally different people. And it, that really got to me more than anything because it, I, it felt the same way towards you. You know, like the perception of, you know, what some, what or who someone is, and then you get to talk to them or, you know, mingle with them in, in the personal life. And, you know, she was really, really cool. And to see 22 years later, 21 years later, that she's in an XPW ring still, and Rob Black is back in business. I thought that was pretty cool, man. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I love how this like has come full circle too. Like I'm definitely a firm believer that nothing happens uh, coincidentally. Yeah. Um, I really you know, believe in serendipity and, and faith and everything else. But, you know, Veronica is a lovely, lovely person. Um, I, I, I absolutely just adore and respect and admire her. And she's been a mentor to me in the wrestling world as well as the adult world and just as a very wonderful friend and person I I cherish deeply. And, you know, that's the problem that we face as being adult entertainers is that people view us in a certain light, much like they do other celebrities or, you know, athletes and entertainers, um, mostly actors too, people get attached to the figure that they idolize, but mm -hmm. they don't keep in mind or realize that we're all human beings, you know, wrestlers are human, you know, uh, adult film performers are human beings. And for some reason, there's just this, it's a deeper attachment that people have to our personas. I think it's because the role we play is more common throughout the stuff that we do potentially. So like, you know, I don't know. There's, there's some, some element to it that people become attached to us as this fantasy figure and they don't allow themselves to understand that we're human beings at the end of the day. So one of the things that I do that I've taken on in my life is to try to humanize the adult industry. So I've gone out and tried to uh, break down the barrier between adult and mainstream and try to educate people and just even share my experiences and talk to people, just have a normal conversation where you go, wow, you're actually a human. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, we have lives, we have children, we have feelings, we, you know, yeah. and I, I think it's important for everyone to understand too that <laughs> because we're under so much scrutiny and judgment and stigmatized so much, like 
it's dangerous for us to even exist a lot of the time. You know, it's an uphill battle with the legal systems, with the religious community and any, you know, opponent of just our mere existence, let alone our profession. Yeah. So I try to go out and break down that barrier. And that's probably one of the things that I'm most known for doing. I'm very proud of that. I'm a sex educator. Um, I really enjoy public speaking on panels and going out and doing the tough conversations. I debate people, I debate feminists and, um, you know, religious leaders and heavily involved in that community. Um, I was involved in politics. One of my degrees was in political science. So I, you know, the political spectrum, uh, that world I'm very familiar with. So try to make, you know, changes in the, on the legislative slide. So it's a lot, it's, but it's great. Like those are things that mean the world to me because I want my son to grow up in a world where he doesn't have to experience the shame from what I do for a living. Because if we could take away the shame that surrounds sex work, that surrounds the adult entertainment industry, even just around how we in our private lives handle our own bodies and our personal relationships with our lovers, then if there wasn't so much shame and stigma attached yeah. to sex and just our bodies in general, that's the world that I'm trying to create, you know, for him and, and for everyone else. So it would be a, a less judgmental, more accepting world. Well, this is a couple of things that I noticed. You know, when we first started talking, you know, I, I look, I got messages from few people. And, you know, I quickly saw the difference and, um, you know, no, no disrespect personal to some of those other people out there, but, you know, I labeled them dumpster fires. It might've been a little bit too extreme, but, um, what, what I noticed about you from doing research early on when we first started talking is I see toys for tots, you know, for cerebral palsy awareness month. I see you on all of these stroke sites, medical sites. I see you in all of these aspects. The funniest thing about it, no joke, I swear to you. And if you have anyone out there is above the, 18, uh, above the age of 18 and you wanna see for yourself. I went on even Google image and I'm like, let me find a couple of like video artworks, you know, I'll censor it, you know, just to show. I couldn't find anything other than this interviews. It's about your, the, we're going to talk about your, your stroke and your heart surgery. It's about your son. It's about awareness. It's about, you know, public speaking. And I'm like looking at all. So I'm like, holy shit, part of my, part of my French, but you know, like, Wow, you know, like there are a lot of layers about Misha Montana that I think a lot of people did not realize. I certainly didn't. And, um, you know, I quickly understood, like you said, you know, me, I, you know, I, and I'm just being straight out honest, I don't think I could date someone or be married with someone in the adult film industry because me, I'm a jealous Italian, you know, and <laughs> if I see my, my, I just got married four, five months ago. And, yeah, um, right. you know, Thank you. But you know, like me, I'm jealous. I'm like, I, I'm break his, but I just couldn't do that. <laughs> but when this controversy came out and we're not jumping ahead, I just want to say something really quick about Matt Riddle. When this controversy came out about Matt Riddle and I'm trying to like look at the names and the faces and then try to like learn a little bit about everyone. What I started noticing right away is, you know, like you said, there is a, a personal side and there's, there's a real side that nobody really looks at. They just look at the superficial side. And, um, you know, you see even with relationships that I said this on my show many times that I think someone in the adult film industry may have a more difficult time meeting someone outside of the film industry because of the stigma, because of the, how the perception it is, or, you know, everything that you said. And I think that's why when this controversy came out about Matt Riddle, you know, I think what happened is, is you see all these layers about you, you know, and you're a mother and he's a father and you see that you have a lot of issues you know, that you've overcome 
and challenges and you relate to each other. And it's not simply that, oh, we go out and we have fun. And I think that's what a lot of people miss the boat on with this. They think because of your industry, the relationship is about the physicality side. Like everybody thinks about the physical side, but not the emotional side. And that's why when I saw, you know, took notice of how everybody was labeling you, you know, and just jumping to conclusions and then making the accusations against him, accusing him of this, accusing him of that, accusing him of this. And what kind of blew me away about it, and I'll give you the floor. I'm watching people in his past accusing him of this, calling him this, saying this, warning you about this, doing this, do that. But yet they're putting up highlight videos, montages, that I know is editing and putting stuff together probably took them hours, days, weeks, like a highlight video package of all these beautiful things. And I'm like, if this person is so bad, or if this situation is so bad, and you'll, why, it's just a, and that's why I think in, in you know, what you deal with, I think for some out there, when they do meet someone, you know, it becomes a much more uh, of a challenge or, you know, you feel like, oh, I got him, you know, and that's it. But there's a lot more than just the physical side. And that's why I got to commend you. You know, when I started, you know, trying to like know, get an idea of who you are. And then let's just talk about science for a second. You know, um, you had a stroke. You didn't even know you had it. You don't go to the hospital, you go to sleep. And you wake up the next day, and half your, bo half your body is almost numb, you can't talk, and you go to the hospital your yourself, and they find out that not only did you have uh, a stroke, but they found the condition, um, a hole, you had a hole in your heart. And that, this is not even two years ago. So how, how, have, how are you feeling now? with this you know i i made the mistake after i had the stroke i i've always tried to lead by example and try to turn things that are negative into you know a positive and uplifting situation because for some reason i've made it just a personal mission that gives me joy and peace in my life and like a profound purpose is to try to help other people because i think there are so many people that suffer silently from you know various things whether it be you know physical illnesses or you know mental health illnesses um i was bullied to death as a child and so i tend to gravitate m more towards people that have been heard themselves too and if i have the ability on the platform that i have to stand up for other people or to make an example to give them some a semblance of hope and strength and courage in their life that's the type of person that i want to be because at the end of the day what i do for a living means absolutely nothing in the scheme of things you know cockroaches have sex it's not, you know, it's not the biggest deal in the world. The impact that you leave on the world is, you know, how you want to be remembered. And when I had the stroke, internally, I was terrified. I had no idea what my life would look like. From that day on, my life changed forever. And, you know, as much as I tried to avoid that topic or try to mask you know mask the damage that was done the worst thing that happened about the stroke would honestly be that i physically recovered so well that people forget that i even had a stroke yeah because and i didn't help that situation because i went right back to work two weeks later i was just hell bent and adamant about proving a point to myself and to other people that I never actually recovered. And so I've been suffering the consequences quietly for a long time with my memory situation yes. is, is bad. Um, you know, it's worse than people even realize because I never wanted it to affect 
my life more than it had already. You know, it took so much away from me, but I didn't want it to distract from my work from my advocating, you know, I wanted it to be a story that had redemption, that had a happy ending, that, and not saying that it didn't, but I also, I downplayed a lot of the consequences that I suffered from my stroke. And I think I'm kind of, you know, biting the bullet now and having to admit that it affected me more than I ever let on. Yeah. Um, you physically, and, you probably needed more time to just take a step back, but emotionally you had to tell yourself, this isn't going to take my control of me. I'm going to kick yeah. its ass. I'm it's no, you're not going to stop me from going to work. I saw an interview you did with a doctor and not to get too explicit here, but when you're telling the doctor, you're like, Hey, you know, I, I just used my left hand <laughs> instead of my, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I just like, that. that is so like awesome because I'm saying to myself, you know, yeah, your body's telling you, you know, my father had quadruple bypass surgery two years ago. He was in the hospital for three, four days. A lot of people that follow my shows saw it in real life, in you know, real time. Five days later, He's on the roof of his house, like trying to move things. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, you don't understand. He's like, I got to get back. I got to get back. I got to get back. And I, and I, I, I think, yes, you're paying the price a little bit now, but what an inspiration for a lot of people out there. Because look, back in 1997, there was a documentary called Wrestling with Shadows, uh, featured Bret Hart. And I know people right now, like, where are you going with this DT? And basically what it did was it, it, they were doing camera work behind the scenes in WWF monitoring Bret Hart, like what it was like in a career of Bret Hart. You'll see where I'm going with this. And um, while this is all going on, WWF's having money problems. And in the midst of it, he gets an offer to go to the competitor. And this was not planned in the documentary, and it ends up with the biggest screw job in the history of pro wrestling, and this is all documented. And meanwhile, you, they're doing a documentary about you, following you around to learn a little bit about you, and then you have the stroke. And then you, have, you find out you have a hole in your heart that, you, that was undetected, that is not detected by, I think, a quarter of people out there that have it. And, um, you know, it's like, they're documenting you and then it's like the same thing like you end up with this unbelievable circumstance and i tell you early on i think people online thought that you were making it up until you showed up on all of these uh, and then people like holy shit not only that was a weird thing too about it was that people i never really got the whole i made it up yeah. um narrative i one uh, it's it's shocking to me you know the internet is uh, the most wonderful in like in te- most wonderfully intended invention and it's it's kind of like the bible in a sense too like if you wield it for good or evil you know and then people will shun me for that comparison but it's true you know when you weaponize things that are meant to be good it's it has just the most destructive properties and you know the internet saying that i made up my stroke well then there was which you know this current situation like regurgitated this um bullshit for lack of a better word is that the my stroke was drug induced because i was a drug addict because of course you know in our profession one of the things that's most stigmatized about us that I fight hard all the time to try to um, shut down that narrative is that we all have substance abuse problems. Um, we're all uneducated. There's nothing that we could do other than have sex on camera for a living. You know, we're horrible parents. We're this, that, and the other. There are all these negative, false stereotypes attached to what we do for a living. So that was really devastating to me, too, because here, I've suffered a series of serious, complicated health problems that, you know, could have taken my life, 
dramatically impacted my life, my family's life. You know, anyone that comes in contact with me from that point forward has a different version of what I've been my entire life. And having to deal with and process all of those emotions, as well as dealing with the physical um, repercussions and uh, the depression and the memory loss and all of these things. And then you have people going on and saying that, well, this was drug induced or, you know, she was making it up in the first place. Like this never happened. And it's just, it's always shocking to me. Like, I shouldn't be shocked anymore by what people come up with, but I am sometimes just like totally bewildered because I'm like, where did that even come from? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, not you're leaving. Well, you're not leaving it out. I mean, it's just uh, something that I want to point out also at this time of you having this stroke and having heart surgery, you have a five-year-old son who is dealing with cerebral palsy. I say that fast ten times. Um, so you know, if if if, and that's why you know to to go back to the to the riddle situation. I mean, look again. I know majority of people tuning in are going to be uh, wrestling fans and dumpster fires. Yeah, but the thing is, you know. When the accusations came out that he was doing drugs with you, and I have the tweet, but I'm not going to post it because we don't want to give any attention to anyone else out there. But I will say this, um, you know, for everyone out there, and I brought this up before, but unfortunately people don't want to know the truth. When people came out there and immediately said specific items, you know, that uh, supposedly you were doing and he was doing and this, this, and that, that is from an August 2022 tweet that someone posted to basically try to slander, you know, Matt Riddle. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that. They based the drugs on a tweet from August. And then you have people who were involved with him saying that he's doing drugs with you. And then meanwhile, in the midst of all of this, you know, you had a stroke, you had heart surgery, you got this, you got that. And, you know, the last person that's going to be doing any type of substance right now is you. And, you know, you see that floating around online and, you know, that's an extra battle that you have to deal with because not only physically you're trying to deal with this, not only emotionally you're trying to deal with this, not only are you, you know, taking care of your son and trying to have a, a, a relationship and, and multiple jobs and speaking engagements and charities and this and that, you got to deal with the bullshit on social media that, oh, she just made that up for attention. Oh, she just did this because, you know, you know, oh, buy my movie. <laughs> you know, and um, it's a shame. It's a shame. I envy you. No joke. I'm not trying to pander to you, but I'm like, she's, she's tough son of a bitch to say it bluntly. Thank you. You know, I appreciate well, there's a couple, a couple points to that one. The first and foremost, I would like to say is I listened to, it consumed my life for several weeks. This entire dumpster fire is my favorite um, description of this entire thing because it's completely accurate. Um, and, you know, I listened to your show. And the reason I even reached out to, I reached out to you in the first place was because I listened to you and I'm like, I think you're one of the only people, if not the only person, that actually looked at a situation not for what people were presenting it as, but actually looking at it with some semblance of intelligence and reason and logic. And you were completely correct in all of your um, your breakdown and um, the theories that you had. And just common sense that you were presenting, I was um, that was appealing to me because it was completely accurate. And it was this small minority um, because everybody was drinking the Kool-Aid and the problem, you know, that people have it, you know, there's a, there's something in experimental psychology that recognizes that the first impression or the first piece of information that people are given is resilient and anything thereafter, they will contradict, you know, 
um, they will deny that there's any fact to any opposing information after they're exposed to the first thing. Yeah. So you're automatically fighting an uphill battle from the get-go. If somebody presents, you know, um, this picture of who you are as a person, and then you come out and try to explain yourself or even just present another picture, they're more inclined to follow that first um, the first impression that they were given or the first information that they received. And I've noticed that a lot. And it's the most unfortunate thing to me. And I operate on this. I'll start actually with this thought. Because if you look at celebrities or people, you know, of any kind of prominent figure, people say horrible things about them all the time. They allegate things, they, you know, they don't agree with how they raise their children, they don't agree with what they wear, they don't agree with, you know, how they present themselves, what they say, etc. Being in the public eye, you're under a magnifying glass times a thousand to what any person, you know, can ever understand if you're not in that in that spotlight. And most of the time you see like if somebody levies some kind of disagreement even against like the Kardashians, I hate using them as an example, but you know, perfect example. They don't respond to every criticism. They don't respond to outrageous things. Um, one, because, and I operate under this model and this uh, assumption as well as I was always raised that the loudest person in the room is the most foolish. And if you speak and you want people to listen to you, it has to be profound and with purpose. And therefore, it's not often, <laughs> you know, like when you speak, people will go, wow, like there must be something important that they have to say. Because otherwise, if you're just mindlessly spewing whatever thought pops in your head, whatever emotion you feel that you immediately respond to and are now glorified and validated by the internet, you know, it makes you look so foolish and so stupid. Yeah. And essentially like then you are too for, do, for behaving that way. I never wanted to be seen in that light. As difficult as it is, and don't get me wrong, you like no one can understand how difficult it is to watch people slander you, you know, defame you, and then rip you to shreds, rip your personal life to shreds, just tell bold-faced lies that you know are lies, um, and sit there quietly and try to say nothing. Yeah. But well, I think, you know, yeah, I, it's crazy. Not, not to interrupt you, but there's no. a good example of it. You know, a um, few people made some very strong accusations online, but they were not specific. It's not that we wanted to know what the specific specificities were, but the thing was, is if you're going to make a wild claim, especially about someone who is a public figure, a celebrity, you know, you, you, you can't just throw a little nibble out there and then say, hey, check out my OnlyFans, you know. Um, the reason why I labeled people dumpster fires originally was because, you know, I, I've said this before, and I'm not a, I'm not proud of it, but, you know, since I'm an older person, maybe some people could relate. You know, I know 20 years ago, the biggest thing around was Jersey Shore. Well, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, I'm around Jersey Shore people before Jersey Shore was ever a thing. And when I would come go to a club and you would see a bunch of guys there and they would, they would lie and say anything they could to get with a girl. And, you know, sometimes they succeeded. And, you know, sometimes a girl wants to have a casual, you know, or start as a casual relationship with someone just to have fun, just to not be alone. And, you know, you get someone. And the problem is, is that one person may see it one way. The other person sees it the other way. And someone may get love struck over someone. And then when they find out that how they felt is not the way the other person felt, Oh, you're an abuser. You lied to me. You said this to me. You said this. 
And it's like, that's not abuse. You just found the wrong person or that person found someone better than you. You know, and that's the thing with 2023 that's wild about it is people make all these wild claims and I'm seeing people out there and how you could tell that people are just part of my language, just, you know, full of shit is you call someone the most evil things in the book to the point where this tweet comes up And this is about Matt Riddle, and you're featured in the picture as well. And I'm very jealous of the setup, but that's awesome. And he's basically saying, look, for the first time in a a long time, I'm saying no. I'm setting boundaries. I couldn't be happier. And instead of people saying, like, you know what, you know, He had past relationships that went sour. A lot of issues, maybe just wants to, you know, have fun and, you know, just maybe not be alone at first. Maybe just try to like, you know, enjoy life. He just got a a BJJ in, in judo. You know, he's doing things to make him happy. And he goes out there and he tells everyone, look, for the first time in a long time, I'm in a better place. And that tweet pisses people off. And I'm like, How could you turn around and say, woe is me? I, you know, I was abused and I was this and that. And then you turn around, you get angry when you see someone is in a better place. And, you know, it's just horrible uh, of what I see going on. That's why I label people dumpster fires because no, you were not abused. You just found the wrong person. You know, I, I've always, and what I've noticed since, I've, I've grown up on, an, on a phrase also that hurt people hurt people. And yes, some people are hurt. And some people have every right to be hurt. Hurt sucks. I've been hurt. You've been hurt. We've all been hurt. But how you deal with that hurt, you know, speaks volumes. And when you see someone out there immediately labeling this, accusing this, calling this that, but on the same sentence, and posting a video montage of all the wonderful things like you know uh, that's just it's it bl- it just blows me away and it, it, thank that's why i thank god i'm not a celebrity uh, i'm not i mean it's just what you see is just horrible and that was the the thing that really made me you know it, it, from day one i never accused you of being a dumpster fire you know, I just started looking. I'm like, wait a minute, something doesn't match up over here. You know, and I'll tell a quick story, and I'm not saying that you're promiscuous or he's promiscuous or anything else, but back in 1991, there was a girl in my neighborhood. Her name was Jessica Lopez. And a lot of people out there know this story already. And she slept with everybody. And you're in your early 20s, and everybody is like, oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. I'm, I'm, from, I'm in New York, by the way, for people that don't know. And um, in Queens, New York, you're like, she was the girl that everybody wanted to hook up with. We had a, a guy that we used to hang out. His name was Craig. And he was a little bit of a player, Jersey Shore wannabe back then before it was Jersey Shore. Go to clubs, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, you, you want to hey, you want to go to my house? Hey, I got a pool. And you got this player and you got this woman who, you know, slept with everybody and they started dating. And I remember everybody that we hung out with left. I left too. I'm like, they're like made for each other. If you did, they're still married now. They have kids. I love. They never ever cheated on each other. We, I saw them about eight months ago, and I'm like, you just sometimes you meet someone when you least expect it, and things just click, and you know people for some reason will never understand that you can't force it. You can't create it. You can't tweet yourself into a situation. You can't video montage just into a situation. You can't hate or warn someone else. Hey girl, better be careful. They said you're 31 years old, right? You're 31. I'm 33 now. Oh, you're 33. Okay. So you were 31 when you had the stroke. So you're 33. You have a seven year old son. You know, I, I, I think, you know, you, pretty much have control of your life. I think you're a pretty small cookie that, hey, I can take care of myself. I don't need anybody to take care of me. But when you pretty much say that without saying that, for some reason, they just decide to label you this, label you that, accuse you of this, accuse you of that. And um, it, it it, it takes a hell of a lot to not wanna just 
go out there and say, listen, everyone, shut the fuck up. This isn't true. This isn't true. What you're saying about this is true. You know, someone being absent, it's more about mental health than this or this and that. You know, how do you not resist to want to just go out there and just start screaming at everybody online for, for doing what they're doing? Well, you know, I, and I'll be completely honest, like that few weeks, just every day there was something I'd wake up and it would just be like, what is happening now? And I was having a difficult time not responding, to be honest, because I, you know, at first it's like some things happen and you're like, oh, this will blow over, let it pass. But then when it was just like relentless, and it wasn't getting the reaction that they anticipated at first. So then it goes further and further and more outrageous and more vicious and more slanderous and like, you know, and vile and toxic. And then everybody gets swept up in the storm. Um, I was just totally shocked, but I, I wanted to publicly shut it down. I was advised not to by pretty much every single person that yeah. matters in my life. Um, you know, everyone, every person in my life, like, I know it's hard, but let, you have to, you have to let it go. And I, at some point, you know, and that's why I wasn't going to talk about it at all. But, you know, I'm just as everyone's entitled to their feelings about something, I'm entitled to say how I feel about this too because the thing is you know and this is why i tried to exercise some restraint and control believe me off camera you know i have words that you know i would say you know um i'm trying to be the bigger person publicly and respectfully as difficult as it is especially when you know i probably wouldn't have said a whole lot about it either even though like i'm fiercely protective of people in my life it's one thing if you come after me um i'm able to handle this i weather these things i have for a long time and there's nothing you can say to me or about me that will get under my skin i promise you know and but the problem that i have is when you start going after people that i care about that are innocent that don't have anything to do with it you know particularly my son um you know the the problem that i have with this situation too and anything like this situation is that like you mentioned you touched on you know hurt people hurt people you know suffering or inflicting suffering onto other people that have hurt you validates our feelings mm. if you operate on that level of you know of hatred and vengeance and you it's a human thing and that's you know i hate making excuses for people but i understand being hurt i understand that people are very hurt and for that i feel for them i do what is unacceptable and just heartbreaking and disgusting in my mind is that you can weaponize you know pretty much anything against yeah. anybody that's in the public eye yeah and not just only you obliterate their public reputation potentially you know their careers like i don't know how we got to a place where you're guilty until proven innocent yes, yes. and you know i can literally levy any allegation against anyone that i've ever been photographed with you know and then you're obligated to believe me why yeah <laughs> Well, what did I do to earn that? Yeah. Um, what evidence do you have? But I think, you know, this, the internet world, we've lost our fucking minds. We've lost ourselves to the internet, to technology, to social media. You know, everybody has a soapbox that they think, you know, they, their opinion is relevant in the world and matters. And it's been weaponized. Like, we've lost touch of who we are as human beings. There used to be logic. There used to be reasoning. You used to have to research things. You used to have to formulate intelligent, you know, thoughts before you spoke um, to get any kind of credibility. And now it's like anything that pops in your mind, you 
just vomited onto the internet without even giving it a second thought without thinking about the consequences and i honestly in my opinion i think there should be criminal charges for people that do these kinds of things on the internet and levy false allegations or slanderous or, you know libel slander any of these things that people engage in there should they should be held accountable because it's just the problem is is as ridiculous as it is to people that understand that it's just ridiculous it has very real consequences yeah. potentially you know you're impacting people's personal lives their careers their safety their children's well-being i mean for what because it used to be that like when you break up with someone or your feelings get hurt or someone doesn't want you and want someone else you have a bowl then of you ice get a, cream and you, you yeah you, pine, ice cream and fry it out you know yeah but you know that's not the case if we worked at home depot that would be the case yeah, yeah. unfortunately for us we don't well, so you know and in that sense like it's it's crazy to me and the audacity then i won't you know there's one in particular has is to boldface lie about me yeah. knowing that i could put a nail in this coffin right now and end this whole thing yeah well <laughs> but will... the, good the problem that you know i think the it's um i think it was not intentionally in doing so i think it's just a bold and you know a sense of of arrogance but um the, the, the thing that that prevents me from doing that too is one i don't operate on that level um i don't believe in this twitter drama i think it's unfortunate too especially like as sex workers i always caution i mentor girls women um in this industry i always caution people against going on twitter or like starting public wars with fellow entertainers or you know with people in our industry because there's so many bigger issues that we face in the world you know we're, we're fighting an uphill battle against people that want to take away our right to survive why are we fighting with each other right. And so I've never enjoyed that. I don't engage in drama. If you'll see, like I may rarely make comments about anything um, because I'm an adult and I choose to, you know, walk away. Plus, you know, it's like how you harness and control your emotions, that's definitive of your character to me. I don't want to look mentally unstable and unhinged, which is what I think a lot of this stuff promotes is like you know um you're trying to find I, I, a breaking I, point yeah it's like you know and that's what i think you know what a lot of that what is too is like the reason that it escalates and it changes and then it like evolves into something more serious or like you know it's because it's poking the bear and the bear is not responding right that you people want responses and that they want you to engage they want to be mentioned they want validation this a lot of these things are because their their feelings weren't validated and they feel that they're somehow entitled to be validated um and i won't you know give be the one to give it to you so then you start throwing out things where okay well now we're tiptoeing on the verge of being in a legal battle yeah because like some of this stuff is just outrageous and also like I, you know and i don't want to give it more attention i'm not trying to fuel the fire again um it's just one of those things that it's it needed to be addressed by me um because the position that i have in my industry and in my life the things that i'm doing matter you know not to myself it's not for self-gratification it's for the better of people in my industry for you know my son the projects and everything that i'm involved in and advocate for when you come after me and try to slander me it's just devastating to me because of you know the, there's a bigger picture that is just getting destroyed because people's feelings were hurt yeah and it sucks in a simplified version. Well, you know, it really does. 
the good thing about it now, and I'm not just saying this to try to make you feel better, and I'm only one voice, but I could tell you from the outside looking in, the perception overall is that people are have figured out you know, much of the truth. Some people will choose to ignore it because it's not entertaining enough. But I think at this stage of the game, because a couple of weeks ago, you know, you didn't want to go here, you didn't want to attend this, you didn't want to attend that, but, you know, you you just went to the, was it the X-Biz Awards? You just went yeah. last week. I, I, I know this is the picture that was floating around, but this is the picture that everybody wanted to see instead. <laughs> yeah. It's the same outfit, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's the same night. But, um, you know, now you're, you know, you're out and about, and it seems like things are starting to calm down. And I think at the end of the day, I think what people need to realize is that, look, you know, the only thing that you're guilty of doing that has that has anything to do with any of this controversy online is all you did was meet somebody. You know, yeah. that's all you did. You know, you didn't try to steal this or take this or slander this or rub it in someone's face. There's no montage videos. You know, it's just... Hey, you know, I got a lot of bullshit in my life. I got a health issues. I have a son that I have to take care of. I have a career. I have, you know, my causes that I have to f deal with and fight for and try to inspire others. And, you know, it, all, all I did was just meet somebody. And for some yeah. reason, that is like the worst thing in the world. But it seems like now, uh, honestly, <laughs> it seems like it has really I, calmed down. It really does. It, you know... I'm glad that it has because that's the thing that's like the most bizarre part of this entire thing is that, you know, we're, people are angry that we're in love with each other. And I, but I think, you know, that the problem too was, I mean, we all know, you know, the, the internet wrestling community is ruthless. And when this I was all flying around, and like you said, you know, I don't blame people for like lumping me in with the dumpster fire situation because they don't know any better, especially at first, you know, but then I think, like you said, I, there are a lot of people that were coming at me just so aggressively at first. And then they're like, okay, hold on. Like, I see how you are, you know, I see. And there, I'm obviously there's some stragglers that are just going to be haters forever, but that's, you know, typical. Um, but no, for the most part, it really has. And that was what was so crazy too, is like, you know, a single, two single people, that are having fun dating casually some of coming off of very very serious relationships that are, were long term and you know wanting to go out and date and have fun and be casual and you know that's not a crime you can date people and like even like you know like you, that jersey shore story is funny too because it's like i mean how many times have guys been like you know baby i love you like yeah. you know and then you know, I mean, you have to take personal responsibility at some point, too, where the thing that annoys me the most about people, and I was told this um, when I was in high school, I was like, I feel used. And um, uh, there was an older woman figure in my life at the time that was like, you were used? How so? And I was like, well, you know, he just wanted to have sex with me. And that was it. And he, you know, that, like, fuck him, you know? Yeah. So, well... Did you want to have sex with him? Yes. Well, then how are you being used? You know, it's like we make choices. He told me that, he loved me. You know, I mean, right. you know, see, the thing is, there's no one <laughs> definition of love. You That's know, true. That's 100% correct. Yeah. And you well, can say whatever, but the thing is, like, you know, I, again, like, that's not criminal. Yeah. Um, you know, like somebody or the may and you know, maybe that's true. Like then that's wonderful. But then also people have a right to change their minds. They have a right. To, I mean, some people lie that happens, you know, it's like, it, it, but again, like a heartbreak doesn't equal abuse. It doesn't equal, you know, rape and regret are not the same thing or, you know, weaponizing. These are f serious accusations. Yeah you know, without any kind of merit, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's like, 
and I, you know, I got, of course, like, as soon as I say something about it, then you get the whole, like, oh, you hate women, you're a victim shamer, all these things. It's like, I absolutely am not. And for people to think that is so ignorant. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, like, a lot of people just are, they don't look at things with critical thinking or logic at all. Um, but I would hope, you know, any reasonable person that would be reasonable about anything would understand what I'm saying and what the situation is, just like much as yourself. Like, you're looking at a situation and go, look, something's not right here, because it's not. You know, you have to to think about things logically. Does this make sense logically? And so, you know, it's, it's just, and it's an unfortunate climate that we live in that those things are able to, to happen. Sense. and. Yeah serious impact and catch as much traction as they do but you know to be that was the thing that bothered me too where it was like when he and i met each other i knew about everybody just as they knew about me and so all of a sudden now they don't know it's like it's shocking to me you know, um not to interrupt you know what i think the problem was not to interrupt you know what i think the problem was no. when, when you and i talked over the last you know five, six weeks, whatever it was, there was a lot of, there's a lot more about you two that nobody knows because you didn't say, oh, I was here, I was here, I did this, we did this, we went here, we went here. It's like, unless you, they know your whole agenda, you know, like, where did she come from? You know, and so it's, it's none of their business. It was none of my business either. But I think that's where that came from, that because you didn't video document every little, you know, interaction, that it almost looks like in, you know, out of nowhere situation. And it was Right. You're right. And that's like, I need to keep that in mind, too, because in my mind, I know what it is. Yeah. But then also, you know, not everyone is a mind reader. Not everyone has been witness to my life and, you know, last however long. And so you're right, like people don't know just how serious our relationship is. And it's, uh, you know, I was Nobody's business, it's not even my business. It's, it's nobody's not, business. It, it never will be. And that's the thing too, I know people are like waiting for, that was the thing too, you know, if I could wanted to go out and seek attention from this and be like, I was here with him then. And, you know, all these like ridiculous, like middle school type, games and behaviors that these people are engaging in um i just choose not to like because i don't need to because here's the thing i'm sitting here i know who i am i know what our relationship is and also like i think one of the things that's appealing about you know me without the risk of sounding arrogant is that i never wanted to like capitalize on dating him in that situation i don't need that you know, I don't need, like, dating him is a wonderful thing for me because of who he is as a person. Yeah. And that's what he and I have such a strong bond because we love each other as people and we relate to each other on levels that people can't even begin yeah. to understand. And that's not spiking uh, the football and that's not throwing in anybody's <laughs> faces and that's not saying I'm better than you no. or I'm more. It's just, you know, two people click. It's the story I said earlier. You know, if you would have said to me 30 years ago that these two people would still be married with all the, <laughs> you know, these kids that were now in their twenties, yeah, you would, I would have thought you're nuts. So it right. just happened. And it's, you know, they do. it is what it like that. It's such a beautiful thing. And like, it was just, just such a crazy thing. But you know, a lot of people, you don't see me posting every single the one picture that i did post this is exactly why i never posted anything before <laughs> because of what happened with that one post that the broke the friggin internet um, i think i have but it. it's like, yeah this one yeah that's where it is <laughs> um that you know it was like i wanted to share a moment with him and what a mistake that was <laughs> So uh, uh, I think sooner or later it probably would have came out, but you know, it would have, yeah. you know, and the, the thing is, is like, it, it would have come out eventually. It, I wish it was, you know, a different situation, but the silver lining to this is that negative, toxic, 
people have been removed from all of our lives um, and we're happier than ever is healthier than ever cool. um, everything is going in such a wonderful and positive direction and you know as much as people have tried to obliterate that you know I there's nothing that they can do to to rattle us um, and it's just I feel bad for them I really do I, I still do um, and I hope that everybody finds like peace and happiness in their lives and you know you don't fixate on trying to cause people so much hurt and damage and pain and, and I'm, I'm sorry for people that are in pain I, yeah. I wish you nothing but healing in your life so yeah. we, we were going to do this two weeks ago and obviously with you know, you had some events coming up we waited two weeks plus we wanted to wait till after the royal rumble because you know wrestling fans there would have been yeah i got so you gotta you gotta let us know is he in the royal rumble is it and i'm like look the, the, i'm talking to her i'm not talking to him i mean yes if we didn't bring up the situation people would be like oh you know I, but the but the thing is i'm glad we waited two weeks because a I'm lot has changed in two weeks for the better for the yeah. better it has it really has and the more time that you know goes on too and the thing you know it's it's not my business i don't think it's appropriate to speak on anyone's behalf you know and that's what you know i love you know how respectful you are with that situation too and no one has asked anybody that i've talked to you know they're very respectful and i really appreciate that a lot but that also because you're genuine and have integrity where a lot of people lack that um and empathy as well so um you know his business is his business and you know i'm not his groupie and i'm not his manager and i'm not his mouthpiece right so you know and every like i keep our personal life completely private as i can they're obviously you know there are moments i get excited about and want to share and then the whole internet freaks out and writes articles about it and then you know also we're not married no. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. we're not um i figured i would address that one too i'm just like oh my god like i can't do anything i'm not gonna do anything ever again but um i'm just kidding but you know it's like all everybody needs to know is that we're happy and healthy and i don't understand either why like people are so infatuated with our private lives like why can't we just live our lives and yeah. it has to be everybody's business like yeah. which again people will be like well you're public figures you ask for this so, um but it's just it's, it's such a weird like level to me too that i've never experienced before where it's just so invasive uh, I'll, I'll tell you this much. I don't. I. I guess we'll we'll ra start wrapping this up. But I, I'll bring up something that I never thought I would even bring up. But I might as well throw it out there now, since you talk to a lot of girls, a lot of women um, who might be new as far as the industry and may deal with what's going on with social media. Do you find it more now and now than ever with the explosion of OnlyFans? that you're getting a lot of women that are not prepared for the backlash or the hate that could come online when someone does blow up? You know, because you, as an actress and a producer and this, and that, you know, you have experience in it, so you've learned and you've grown thick skin. But, you know, are you coming across a lot more women now who have no background, who never went, you know, just decided one day, I'm, you know what, I'm going to turn the camera on and I'm going to, you know, sh show the beauty that I have and, you know, benefit from it and have no preparation whatsoever of what could happen on the, the net as far as the attacks and the hate. Do you come across that more now because of the OnlyFans? I do. And, you know, I speak publicly about this a lot i think that only fans is such a curse in a lot of ways because it was such a wonderful thing for people that want to be involved in, in sex work in the adult industry i always say this i would never discourage it i don't want to discourage anyone from following their dreams what i'll say is that you have to understand that just because something is popular or mainstream it is one not easy money i'll t promise you that right now 
that's the least of your concerns. Two, you have to understand that the stigma and the consequences surrounding what we do for a living are very real. You know, you will lose family members, friends, um, again, the least of your concerns. Um, there's serious, serious implications for being involved in this industry. Emotional. Um, you, I try to advocate for raising the age limit from 18 to 21. Um, I think that, you know, there needs to be more education, even just surrounding entering into the adult industry. I try to mentor as much as I can, but I can only reach so many people and so many people can reach me where, you know, I tell people all the time, these girls trying to get in that it's a business. It's, it's ruthless. Um, you need to have thick skin and, you know, be business minded and savvy and be determined and also be prepared that you're closing a door to literally every opportunity that you had open before you walked into this one. Um, it's not an easy game to get out of and it's also not an easy game to win. So, you know, you have to play all of these things into the equation. Um, if you have kids, you know, there are consequences, you know, it's, it goes on and on, but, you know, I've actually, I had a, a girl who I, as a friend of mine who I've worked with before and she messaged me and she was just distraught about somebody coming after her constantly on, on the internet, but she was engaging with them. And so she's like, how do you get away from dealing with these negative people, these trolls, this, how do you deal with this? And I always tell people this one, I don't respond. Um, I delete them. I delete comments. I delete messages. I block them. And then I don't deal with it again. because you, when you give people power over you, they win. And I've made the mistake, there's been some, I, I got a really racist, nasty one. Like sometimes people know how to like irk me. <laughs> and like, I have no, I just like write this thing out and I was like, it is just ruthless and brutal and you know, to defend myself. And I was so angry. Yeah, we didn't and even then mention I, that you're Russian. Right, yes, and I have <laughs> my blood. Like I am, don't get me wrong, like I can be hot headed. Like I can, it's in me. I've simmered down immensely since my son was born. Like anyone that's known me like in high school, they're like, you are such a calm person now. I was not before, but that goes through years of experience and life experiences and, you know, figuring out what's important in life and also picking and choosing your battles. Like I've learned in life that you only have a limited amount of time and energy on this earth, right? How is that best served? Is it best served fighting the world that disagrees with you or hates you or thinks you're ugly or, you know, it says mean things about you, what you do for a living? Is that really how you want to, you know, spend your time and energy and allow to consume your thoughts and your life? It's not how I want my life to be. So I choose to focus on the positives in life and choose to turn negative things into positive if I can yeah. and try to encourage other people to think that way, to be nicer to, to other humans, to try to put something beautiful back into the world that desperately needs love more than anything. And, you know, I want that to be an example for my son, for Anybody that I mentor, for anyone that ever comes across me, and that I want that to be my legacy and, and my purpose in life. I will tell you. So, I will tell you, it is working because, like I said, I said it more lighthearted before, but I mean this sincerely. Anyone, you know, you're more than welcome to see for yourselves. When I type in your name and try to research and learn a little bit more early on. Like I said, you see the Toys for Tots. You see all of the interviews about stroke, about, you know, women. And, and it, all this comes up. And, you know, it's not just an IMDb 
profile. You know, it's not just your list of, you know, what you've done in the, in the film world. It's a lot of other aspects and all your causes. And it does come up. And you're not going to be correct. able to reach everyone, but you are definitely reaching some. And like I said, I don't pander, I don't kiss ass, but, you know, it's so no. obvious. That's why, you know, early on, you know, when I was looking at this as just a, you know, wrestling fan and trying to, like, who's this? Who's that? Who's this? And then you start looking a little deeper, like, okay, you know, something's different about this. And then, you know, you, you take a step back and then you see, and, you know, there's a lot of layers of Misha Montana that is far from just uh, adult film star, producer, entertainer, girlfriend. And there's a lot more than that. And, uh, you know, I really commend you and just keep doing what you're doing and feel, feel better. I mean, because... I could only imagine, you know, not even two years ago, dealing with the health issues that you did and, um, you know, just what you go through since, you know, it's, uh, and you just do probably 10 times the amount of workload that, you know, someone who did not experience that, uh, you know, it just, uh, I wish you well. I mean, um, is there anything you want to plug before we go? You know, that, you know, it might be a little, like, uh, work safe. Yeah, I'm, like, trying to think, like, what do I have going on right now? No, well, um, well did you, I actually, I have been doing, this is, like, when I, you know, I, don't get me wrong. I love what I do. I love directing. I love performing. I, I really do. But the things that I love the most are, you know, getting to talk about stroke awareness um getting to advocate for our industry i just like i'm hungry for that like debating you know and just like spreading awareness i'm i love that so i'm actually i just got an ambassadorship i'm celebrating for being a part of an organization called the porn conversation that helps to change you know the perception and goes out and educates anywhere from children to adults on, you know, healthy sex, on um, the sex industry. It's controversial because it's obviously sex education by sex workers. But um, I'm so happy to be a part of that. I'm just almost finished with my first article for them. And so stay tuned for some stuff like that. But I have some mainstream horror stuff I'm doing that's coming out this year that'll be fun. Nice. Um, nice. But I'm all over the place. You never know what you're going to get with me. I mean, I was actually, I can actually say this is a huge plug. I am going to be on a brand new reality show um it's on the dosh network okay. ray j is there so um i'm super excited about that that's going to start filming here pretty soon and um yeah so there's a bunch of fun stuff that's safe for work <laughs> that's awesome well i will definitely keep in touch and you know maybe when yes. uh you know if you're in this neck of the woods i definitely uh would definitely love to uh see you in person and just uh you know, hey, just say hello Grab a slice too. Yeah. I would love oh, believe me, there's some awesome New York pizza. I should believe me. Oh, no, I know you know the spots. I'm so about it. So yeah. thank you so much for taking the time and for being somebody that I just think is such a light and a, such a dark community potentially of just people that you know that only care about clickbait and don't care at what cost, you know? And so that's why I chose to speak with you too, because I know that you are a person that operates for genuineness and integrity. So thank you for that. And much love. We are, we are both appreciate it. So. Be well, be well, take care. Thank you, my dear. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.